Welcome back to another episode of the Tech Talks Daily Podcast, where every day we dive deep into the world of technology and innovation. I'm your host, Neil C. Hughes, and today I've got a true tech titan joining us. His name is Dr. Eric Daimler, and with over two decades of experience in the trenches of AI and robotics, I think it's fair to say that Eric is a trailblazer in both the academic and business realms that surround it. He's got a very rich resume. He's worked with the White House as a Presidential Innovation Fellow under the Obama administration. He founded pioneering tech companies and currently leads Conexus, an innovation solution to one of the greatest challenges of our digital age. And I am, of course, talking about the data deluge. Not only is Eric a key player in AI and robotics, though, he also stands at the crossroads of economics, public policy, economics, public policy and technology and provides a unique perspective on how we can shape the development of AI to improve our world. So we're going to talk about all this and also explore his incredible journey that has taken him from AI to data integration and much more. So buckle up and hold on tight as I beam your ears all the way to San Francisco where Eric is waiting to share his story. When people hear about if they have heard about me, it's often from the time that I spent in the Obama White House as the first AI authority during during the last year of the Obama administration. There, there's been some fantastic people that have expanded that role since, and it's now become an office and it's been elevated, but it was really a wonderful time. I've spent 20 years, 20 plus years in and around AI, starting as a researcher at Stanford, at Carnegie Mellon, University of Washington. I got my PhD in the field. And then I've been a venture capitalist on Sand Hill Road and even started several companies. I think I'm on my sixth. This one is an MIT spin out. So research, venture capital, entrepreneurship, and then public policy. Fantastic. Incredible story there, which hopefully we'll get to hear more about a little later. And with more than 20 years experience in the exciting realms of AI and robotics. Can you share some of the most pivotal moments or developments that have helped shape your career in this space? I was just really fortunate for a full confluence of events. One is, as they say, I picked my parents well. I was really encouraged to to pursue some field of engineering, even though my, my father could not relate to me going into software and not hardware. It was of an abstraction for someone trained in aerospace engineering. I it probably fit into the old uh, trope of technology evolution where people say that any technology that was developed before you were 10 or 15 is just part of the background. Any technology that was is developed between the time you're 15 and 30 is something you think you could build a career around. And then any technology that's developed after you turn 30 is against the law of nature. I I just fit in that little window where in the very one of the AI hype cycles I I I thought it was something I could build my career around and so I dove in then thinking that not only was it probably a place that would be just a place to build a career but also a place that people could express themselves humans could become more human by working with computers which may sound counterintuitive to many but I found a certain freedom of expression in working with computers and. I just have enjoyed the developments that I've seen progress. It's really funny, actually, that people may th- not know about how long autonomous vehicles have been in, in in our world. For people not in the field, it may occur like they've been something over the last five years, maybe 10, but people might be able to think in their heads when the first car went down public roads, stopping at public signs. And it wasn't in the 2010s or even the 2000s. It was actually 1983. Wow. Yeah. And, and it was a clear day, good weather. Streets were dry in the van at the time. It probably had more computing power in the back of it than the entire Southern Hemisphere. But, but it went five miles per hour, but it did work. It stopped at stop signs. The point being that I don't work on autonomous vehicles now, but I've been in and around them and I've done some research projects in and around them. And it's been going on for a long time. But 20 plus years is just, it has seen uh, the evolution of these technologies and their application. It's exciting where we're ending up in 2023 with people engaged in the broader conversation about how this can play a role in our lives. 
And it must be incredibly cool to have been on that entire journey. And you did mention the White House a few moments ago, and it would be criminal for me not to go any further on there and find out a little bit more information. And as you said, as a presidential innovation fellow under the Obama administration, you were a driving force behind the US agenda for research, commercialization, and public adoption of AI and robotics. And Again, these are topics that are just starting to enter the mainstream. So I've got to ask, if we were to take you back in time for a moment, what were some of the key initiatives back then during that time, and how have they gone on to shape the current state of AI and robotics in the US? There were some fantastic people with whom I got to work, not only in the White House, in other domains, but also in other parts of the US administration and and the allies of the US, of course. The idea was that we were at the forefront of this group of technologists that needed to be in government more. The debacle of the rollout of healthcare.gov in the United States forced a rethink of the technology expertise that we needed to bring to bear within the government. Before healthcare.gov, it certainly wouldn't be allowed that you could get a cabinet level position reporting to the president if you didn't understand economics, you'd be laughed out of the room. And to say you wouldn't understand public policy, like that's it, that would be just a table stakes, obviously. But you could certainly get senior level jobs if you said, oh, I don't understand that technology thing. After healthcare.gov, that stopped. <laughs> you know, people realized, oh, we need to bring more people into government that understand technology and we need to infuse the people that are there with this sensibility around what's easy and what is hard. That was expressed in various programs and initiatives, one of which I belonged to that allowed us to get into government. What I did day to day mostly was uh, set an agenda for this massive organization called the U.S. government or help, excuse me, help with a team of people set an agenda for the U.S. government and in cooperation with its allies over a very long term about where we would be looking for AI or machine intelligence and robotics to go. This particularly, of course, just made sure uh, the budgets and to some extent the urgency found some purchase in issues related to national defense and in NATO and any of the kind of the different divisions of that, such as AUKUS or the Five Eyes. We were at the time looking at how to conserve the the learnings from an F-16 as we got into an F-22 and an F-35. The reason the U.S. and its allies spent so much money on an F-35 and F-22 development was because we couldn't, with life and and critical confidence, translate all the learnings from an F-16 into an F-22 and F-35. So we actually had to start from scratch. When we then did that, we ran into other problems such as the million different components inside of these programs, each one of which could potentially be corrupted through our adversaries' ownership or interests in any of those little technologies. So that's the sort of thing we worked to uh, to address over a longer period of time. It's a big deal. It's a big job. I hope to go back someday. Wow, incredibly cool. And from there, of course, in founding Connexus and developing CQL, you've gone on to address the growing challenger challenge of data integration and migration. So could you elaborate on how this category theory is applied in this context and also the impact that it's having on data management too? Right. One of the privileges of serving in the government is seeing the very highest level perspectives of some of the largest AI implementations or implementations in general around technology. But for me, it was around AI. I found from that privileged position where some of the bottlenecks would appear for other large organizations. And it was in the bringing together of data and data models. People have certainly got the memo that data is the new oil uh, and all that. And people think about the exponential growth rate of data. What's less appreciated is that there is an exponential growth of data sources. So when you get an exponential growth of data and an exponential growth of data sources, the combination of that is knowledge, where you bring these things together and and create models. That has a combinatorial explosion that's really difficult to 
to reason with. And so in, in one financial services firm, they have an increasing amount of data, but when they want to do ordinary risk management, say who to, how to manage the enterprise's risk exposure or even something as pedantic as do I grant a loan or not grant a loan, they are looking at an increasingly narrow set of the data that they spent money collecting. That's a data integration problem in a broad sense. This is way beyond the 2015-esque in the insights-based AI. This is really beyond that. This is the next step, which is we need to bring together and use all the data that we've spent time collecting. That's a data integration problem. That's the barrier for many of these implementations today as it was back then. That's what was funded by the U.S. government for both applications in defense and commerce and supply chain work back then. The spin out of MIT that's taking advantage of that is something that I saw in the government when I got out, put some money behind, and then jumped in full time to lead. And that's Connexus. We bring together data so large organizations can use it for operational operational uses in, in any number of applications. And just like the autonomous vehicles you mentioned a few moments ago, AI has been around a lot longer than many people realize. And it has entered the mainstream over the last six months. It's all anyone's talking about now. But with it evolving so rapidly, of course, there are concerns about ethics, job, dis- job displacement, and other societal impacts. We've all seen those headlines of the robots with the red eyes and people wanting to ban it, etc. So as someone who has Walk this past many times. You've worked across businesses, academics, and policy. I suspect it's a topic close to your heart. How do you see the balance between technological advancement and its potential repercussions? I guess it's something you're asked a lot, right? You know, this was a topic that would come up with some frequency from elected representatives, to be sure, but yeah. to some extent from the populations at large that would just be concerned about AI. I would scream as lo- as loud as l- loudly as I could that we all needed to be in the conversation around AI and the degree to which it fulfills our dreams of some beautiful utopia or is consistent with some Hollywood script of a dystopia around AI and robotics is really up to us. History is a really interesting topic, not just for just the intellectual satisfaction, but it teaches us and I wasn't a history major, but for me, it teaches me that today didn't have to be the way it is. It could have been a whole bunch of different ways. And that informs the opinion that AI can have a lot of different trajectories. And utopia or dystopia is how we want to express it, how we want to be involved. I can talk more about that, but that's really where I see us needing to continue to have a conversation is how we want AI and robotics to be in a world, how we want to be interacting with it. I was trying to like yell as loud as I can that we need to be in that conversation, but I was manifestly not as effective as introducing a large language model into the world. There's nothing like just getting smacked in the proverbial face with how your job may change to bring to force you into that conversation. So I think Peter, the world has now changed to, to bring people into the conversation around what AI looks like in a way that talking about it doesn't accomplish. Yeah, such a great point there. And- I think you hit the nail on the head there when you're talking about the importance of communities and citizens all being a part of the conversation when leveraging robotics and AI, especially when we're all on this mutual goal or should be of building a more sustainable, secure and prosperous future together, of course. So can you provide any tips or maybe concrete examples or recommendations on how this can be achieved? I realise it's the world's biggest question that everyone's searching for the answer for on right now, but... Anything you'd like to share on them? There's several things to say. One, around this issue of national interests, I can say that it is overly reductionist to to think of the AI battle being merely between the United States and China. That suggests that data collection is everything, which it's really not. It's also about implementation. And we can reason about this just thinking about the degree to which we have many other innovations that are not just based on, we'll say, source material. There are lots of businesses that exist in Europe, that exists in other parts of Asia and other other places around the world that, that do just fine. If we were to say that it, that 
the winner of AI is that country which acquires more data. Where does that leave the UK? Where does that leave Ireland? Where does that leave Germany? Where's it just, it's a silly, I'll just say overly reductionist argument. I think the place to focus for a country is on implementation and adoption, which is a complex conversation by itself, but it's a place to uh, engage. How are we going to apply and use this technology? Researchers will go and companies will go where technology and products are adopted. So looking at where we're going to apply technology, I think is the right focus for a nation state. For an individual, and to some extent for an organization, the preparation can come from being more clear about implicit knowledge. So there's a lot of stuff I have in my head. That is becoming more and more difficult to make use of in an era where we are rapidly automating tasks. The skill to develop is in taking implicit knowledge and making it explicit. So an example is if I am working with one of my colleagues at an office, I I can say, well, I want a project to get done by September. Well, we naturally do then think, well, what is the project? What is the nature of the product? What is this? What are the specific tasks engaged in the project? But we often find that when we lay out projects, we will write them, even written in such a way that they, we think other people can interpret what we have in our heads. And that impairs collaboration, especially when we are in, increasingly using automation tools. So the task is in these projects that I'll work with my colleague on is to become a little bit more like, I'm going to say like a lawyer or or a barrister. How can I be just more specific, more clear to say exactly what I want in exactly what order? People can say that this is computational thinking, which is true. You get some of this sensibility, excuse me, from learning how to program. Sometimes engineers have it. Certainly lawyers have it, if I'm saying becoming more like a, a lawyer, but it's about specificity and clarity. And then lawyers need to become a little bit more like engineers, and engineers need to double down on having their language become even more easily interpretable by machines. That's the virtuous cycle that we're going to see over the next decade. There's been a trend over the last millennia, I guess, but certainly within our lifetimes that we see a, what I'm going to call a formalization, where we begin to routinize certain systems. That accelerates in the era of digital transformation where we need to participate in our own automation. We need to become more clear from our implicit knowledge to explicit knowledge, and then that explicit knowledge becomes automated over time. The other two options, if we don't make our work automated, is one, we become niche players, we become artisans, which is all cool. It's fine. There's wonderful lives to be had in that arena, even though it can be somewhat risky, or you're going to be smacked upside the head when some abrupt change happens and you're surprised. So really, I see three of those choices. You're participating in your own automation, and then you need to regenerate another place for you to play with your work, or you're becoming a niche player, or you're going to be unpleasantly surprised at some point. That's the trajectory. That's the advice. That's what I suggest people work on, is work on formalizing and making explicit their own knowledge. And if we go back, what, to the same time last year, I was at various tech conferences in the US and all over the world. And also in November time, everyone was talking about the tech chains that were going to dominate 2023. And it was all about the metaverse. Everyone's going to be living in the metaverse over the next couple of years. And of course, in the first six months of 2023, I don't think anybody really predicted this huge success of generative AI in particular and how it's dominated conversations. So with that in mind, I'm going to ask you to look into your virtual crystal ball now and ask you, how do you envision the next generation of AI and robotics, particularly in relation to industries that might have traditionally been slow to adapt to the emerging technologies and maybe even thinking about, hey, what is our AI story now? We need to be on this in some way. Yeah, I First, like to defend my colleagues uh, around that prediction of AI. I don't know anybody that predicted AI as being a big deal. Uh, among the people that I know, it was always some degree of ridiculousness. And it certainly got some hype because Facebook was throwing 
billions or tens of billions of dollars into a black hole, and that's warrants some degree of attention. But there was never commercial demand for this. <laughs> Nobody said, you know what I'd really like to do? I'd like to put out some goggles and talk to my wife through the goggles in a pixelated format. That sounds fantastic. That just sounds better than being in real life. I'm traveling tomorrow to New York from San Francisco because yeah. I, I want to be physically with some amount of my family, friends, and colleagues physically there. Uh, goggles aren't going to do it for me. It's some, ha- some avatar is not going to do it for me. Maybe sometime in the future, that could make sense. And there maybe there's some use cases that we'll see develop from Apple's new headset, but there's not a clamoring from that. I'll tell you what there's a clamoring for. What there has been is and will be a clamoring for. There's a clamoring for people collaborating. People want to collaborate more effectively. They also want to get rid of tasks they hate. There's a lot of crappy tasks in the world, a a lot of crappy routine tasks that we don't like to do very much. There's something that we don't see uh, often among the people that probably listen to this podcast and certainly among our friends, the, the vocational level IT work that's really terrible, terrible. And it's often not done in in Europe or North America, but it's horrible work and we need to automate that. That I see as being a need. That's going to be a demand over the next few years is we start to automate this work where we have some really overeducated people ever with master's degrees doing kind of lower level IT work, growing into work that's more appropriate for their jobs. That's something I see over the next two to five years. As an individual, what I see is I see us developing, because there's a demand for this, there's a demand to to take in a lot of knowledge quickly that we see like with ChatGPT, but do it in, on an enterprise scale. So this gets back a little bit to this issue of data integration or model integration. <clears throat> the place where AI provides some of the greatest unrealized value isn't necessarily in automating a car, although that's fantastic, and automating a truck, which we're going to see more, more quickly than automated, fully automated cars. It's in the ability to synthesize the actions of a whole bunch of other tools that I can't quite reason about. The world is becoming just too complex for us to reason about. And so what I need as an executive, but also as an individual, is I need an AI agent around me. Don't call it a shield, but kind of, you could call it like my little concierge around me that interacts with other AIs from others, that helps me reason about a world that is already becoming more complex for me to get a handle on. The errors we see in in some parts of our infrastructure, that is not just random accidents. Those are going to occur with increasing frequency because the systems are becoming too complex for uh, us to actually test and for anybody or even one team to kind of keep in their head and to to develop an, an assurance about. And I think we've all seen those negative news stories dominating our news feeds over the last few months because, hey, bad news sells. It generates more clicks and so does fear. And I always like to try and restore the balance in the universe by looking at more positive impacts these technologies are having. So as someone with an extensive background in AI, computational linguistics and network science, what do you believe are the most promising intersections of these fields for future technological development and the kind of positive impacts they'll have on our world. It is difficult for us to imagine how much knowledge, how much value we can create from that knowledge when we bring together everybody's increasingly explicit understanding of data relationships. So when we are talking in the world supply chain, one of the reasons we've had a breakdown is because (laughs) still the world works on Excel like a shockingly large percentage of the time. <laughs> when that becomes interoperable, when one person's database, it could be Excel, could be anything, one person's database interacts digitally with another person's database, we can have a greater visibility, a greater flexibility into how our systems operate. We worked with one client where they wanted to know during COVID, where are the personal protective equipment boxes that I had sent? In what box? In what container? On what ship? In what? In which fleet? There, there are hundreds of thousands of people involved in these operations, and they still have to do it, or they still had to do it, 
by picking up a telephone. And the task sometimes could take a couple of days. That needs to stop. And the efficiency and the improvements in our lives, just from that, the elimination of those sort of frictions in our life, I think will Im- improve dramatically. There's something like 20, I think it's 20, the US is worse than the UK and Ireland on this, but there's something like 28% of uh, donated organs right now that go to waste in the United States. And it's because of this data integration problem. It's because it's very slow to be interacting with patients because databases don't like to interact with each other. The UK government ha- has something like a 13% waste rate, which is still seems pretty high or higher than it should be, right? For just wasting donated organs. That sort of thing is the type of life improvement that I can expect from integrating data with more alacrity. Another easy one is in drug discovery. Sometimes the reason these projects take so long for drug discovery is because over a long time horizons, people retire, people come into new jobs, and you need to acclimate them into this new set of data without corrupting the existing work. Uh, That's another data integration problem. Sometimes this might sound in the weeds. It might sound really too detailed. Why don't I just hire Accenture or Deloitte to take care of this for me? But Ultimately, somebody needs to integrate these digital systems, and that is being enabled with this, these new expressions of generative AI, whether they are probabilistic or symbolic, which is what Connexus AI works on. And so I am super optimistic about the increases in, in our life quality globally from these developments and AI that kind of root themselves in bringing together more data, more knowledge, and helping humans collaborate with each other faster. We love that. And from an entrepreneurial standpoint as well, another area I know you're passionate about, what challenges and opportunities do you see for new tech startups in the AI and robotics space? And as someone that's frequented this path many times, any advice you'd give to any aspiring entrepreneurs in this field? Well, our Connexus AI is commercializing a discovery in mathematics, mm. which is not usually a phrase that is people are used to hearing on these podcasts. <laughs> the discoveries of math are like laws of nature. Those are like things in physics, math being perhaps even more base. Category theory is this new type of abstract math, not a new type of abstract math, excuse me, but it is an abstract math that allows for knowledge to scale. That's what it does. I, I think that there are going to be hundreds, if not thousands of companies that take advantage of the power of category theory and find other software expressions. Connexus AI is happy to be recognized as a leader in commercializing expressions of category theory, but I think there'll be many others that do this in a range of circumstances. This happens today to some extent. In smart contracts, people are using category theory and in parts of quantum compilers. Quantum compilers actually would not be feasible if not for this type of abstract math, category theory and its related type theory. So it's happening today, but it's going to become more broadly adopted. I tend to, my career has tended to look at technologies that have these deep technical innovations, therefore a little bit of a protective space, and you're not competing against 30 companies that are doing something very similar. So that's the advice generally. People don't need my advice, but if that's where I would look to fund other companies is in the, the multiple different expressions we're going to have of commercial products around category theory. Well, I cannot thank you enough for sharing your insights and recommendations with everyone today. But before I let you go, I'm going to ask you to leave one final gift for everyone. And that's a book to add to a virtual bookshelf that listeners can check out. So all I'm going to ask you is what book would you like to add and why? That's an easy, particularly easy question because my wife wrote a book. Uh, so I can't get away from here without mentioning her book. It's just a good book. It's around organizational culture and organizational design. It was based on an article that was very well received in the Harvard Business Review. It's called Reculturing. So Reculturing, Melissa Daimler, the conceit of it is that we need to operationalize culture instead of just do hand-waving around it being about retreats or having an innovation culture or having free lunches and thinking that is somehow my, my air quotes culture. So Reculturing, it shows how managers, leaders, and individuals can operationalize culture. Fantastic. Great choice for a book there. And hey, you've got out of trouble there as well by mentioning it on here. So your tea will be ready tonight, hopefully. But before I let you go, 
But anyone listening just wanting to find out more information about the great work you're doing at Conexus, just keep up to speed with the developments or contact your team. What's the best starting point for everything? Conexus.com. It's Latin for join. So Conexus.com is the base of our operations. You'll see research papers there that provide the foundation for our commercial expression, and you'll find more information on our commercial expression. And then the usual social outlets, you'll sometimes see me or our team posting and on any new developments. Well, I'll post links to everything so people can find you nice and easy. But just love chatting with you today, learning more about your 20 years of experience in AI and robotics, the most pivotal moments or developments that have helped shape your career, as well as that great work as a presidential innovation fellow under the Obama administration. And not only that, we even had a little giggle along the way of how much of the world still works from Excel and had time to recommend a book written by your wife. Love chatting with you today. I'd love to stay in touch, but thanks for sharing your story today. It was a good time. Thanks for having me. And that wraps up our conversation today. It was fantastic hearing about Eric though, wasn't it? From his time in the White House to his pioneering work at Conexus, it's clear to me that Eric is at the forefront of AI and robotics and leading that charge in leveraging these technologies for a more sustainable and prosperous future. But also understanding the fact that despite all this excitement around emerging technologies and the AI explosion, much of the world does still run on Excel. So it was great taking a deep dive into the world of data integration, the role of communities and citizens, all working together to shape the AI conversation and also the potential of AI in streamlining process, in streamlining processes and solving those complex and nasty problems or tasks that we don't enjoy doing. And I also thank Eric for reminding us on the importance of active engagement, especially in the unfolding AI revolution. Because let's be honest, despite what we read on our news feeds, neither a utopia nor a dystopia is inevitable. Essentially, it's up for us to shape that technological future together. So big thank you to Eric for sharing his wisdom and experiences with us today. And for everyone listening, I invite you to do the same. You can email me, techblogwriteroutlook.com. You can get me on Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, threads, wherever you hang out. Just look for at Neil C. Hughes and we'll keep this conversation going. But it is time for me to sign off now. So remember, technology works best when it brings people together. A big thank you for listening to this podcast every day and please join me again tomorrow so thank you for listening and until next time don't be a stranger